President Franklin Delano Roosevelt often had to endure long receiving lines and he was famously known for being frustrated at how as people came through the receiving line none of them were paying attention to anything that was said. So one day he decided to try an experiment. As people came through the reception line and he was shaking their hands he murmured to everyone that he shook hands with, I murdered my grandmother this morning. He got, he got responses back from them like, God bless you, sir. Marvelous. Good job. Well done. Until finally, at the end of the receiving line, the ambassador of Bolivia came through the line, and he actually was listening to what the president said. And not knowing really how to respond to it, he simply said, well, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> it's funny, but it's amazing, isn't it? Listening is such an important part of the whole communication process that you think we do a really good job of listening, right? But we don't. Husbands and wives, couples in a relationship, often have a lot of difficulty because when one of them is speaking, the other one often is thinking of what they're going to say in response. They're hearing the words, but they're not really listening. And I'm sure all of us can remember back to when we were in high school, right? And we were pleading our case with mom or dad why they should let us do this or do that. And finally, after all the pleading, we ended up getting a no answer. And we walked away muttering under our breath, they just don't understand me. What we're really saying is, they weren't listening to me. It's not just husbands and wives that have problems listening well. It's not just parents of teenagers or teenagers that have problems listening well. Jesus' disciples had a problem listening well. To understand the transfiguration, we have to go back eight days. That's why God had Luke begin the reading by saying eight days days after Jesus said something to the disciples. What did Jesus say to his disciples eight days ago? He asked them a question. He said, who do people say I am? Do you remember the answers? They said, well, some say that you're Elijah back from the dead, or John the Baptist come back from the dead. Others say you're just a great prophet. Then do you remember what Jesus asked his disciples? But you, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter gave his great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But did Peter really know what it meant that Jesus was the Christ? Remember Christ, Christus, is the Greek word for Messiah. The Hebrew word, they both mean the anointed one. Jesus was anointed, appointed to a specific special job. No, Peter didn't know and understand what the Christ was appointed for because when Jesus told him he was anointed, appointed to suffer and die on the cross, remember what Peter said? He rebuked Jesus. No, that can't happen. Why did Peter not understand what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah? It's because Peter wasn't listening when Jesus was speaking to him. Oh, Peter heard the words that Jesus was saying, but he wasn't listening to them for the same reason you and I often fail to listen to Jesus. We're hearing all kinds of other voices instead. Peter? Peter was listening to his own voice. His own voice was telling him what grand and glorious ideas it would be if he was a follower of Jesus. In the rearview mirror would be the lowly life of being a stinky fisherman. In place, you're a follower of Jesus. You're popular. You're somebody. 
Peter was also listening to the voices of his fellow countrymen who were sick and tired of the Romans occupying them and wanted to be rid of the Romans. But a murdered Messiah with cross-carrying companions? That wasn't part of that scenario. But most of all, do you know whose voice Peter was listening to? The voice of the devil, Satan's voice. Not just Satan's voice egging him on to feel sorry for himself for his lowly lot as a fisherman, or to feel sorry because they were some oppressed nation that had a right to disobey their government. No, Satan was speaking to Peter, egging him on to try to get Jesus to not fulfill his mission to be our Savior. Do you remember when Peter rebuked Jesus about when Jesus told him he had to suffer and die? Do you remember Jesus' answer back to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. So the question is, whose voices are you and I listening to? Are we listening to our own voices? When we encounter difficult times in life, struggles and trials and troubles, it doesn't matter how they come. Maybe it's in a relationship, maybe it's with a job, maybe it's with money, maybe it's with your health. When we get to those points, are we tempted to listen to our own voice saying, how bad I have it, how unfair God is being to me? Satan would love if we did that. But we don't need to just listen to our own voice because there's plenty of other voices around, right? There's voices on the radio. There's voices on the TV. There's voices on the internet. There's bloggers and there's people saying this, that, the other thing. Then there's the voices you hear and read on Facebook, in your textbook messages, maybe Instagram, maybe Twitter. But the question is, all those voices that we're listening to, what are they saying? Are they saying, hey, it's great to be a Christian. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus and deny yourself? Or are those voices saying, hey, leave. Leave your cross at the door when you leave the house in the morning. Because it's not really worth it picking up your cross and following Jesus. Is it worth it? To pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus? Is it worth carrying the cross of denying yourself the option to question clear teachings of God's word because they don't make sense with your reason or emotions? I just can't understand how the real body and blood of Jesus can be there with the bread and the wine. I just can't understand how an infant could believe and have faith. Or I don't think it's loving to say that two people who love each other can't have sex before they're married. Or I don't think it's loving to say that if two people of the same sex want to get married, that they can't. Is it worth it carrying the cross of being a Christian at the workplace? I just lost my job because I'm a Christian and of what I believed. Or I just had to quit my job because they were asking me to be party to ending the life of somebody who was suffering. Is it worthwhile carrying that cross of ridicule for Christ? You know, being made fun of at school or other places because of what you believe, or, or losing a friend or two because you're a Christian? Parents, is it worth carrying the cross the Christian cross of competing interests. I've got volleyball and I've got church and I don't know how I'm going to do both of these for my 15-year-old daughter. Like Peter, we love to leave our cross at the foot of the mountain and just stay up there on top of the mountain with Jesus, right? But we can't. We have to go back down the mountain. You're going to have to leave this building today and pick up your crosses that you left at the door and go about your week. Each morning you get up, after you read your devotion and do your devotional, you're going to have to pick up that cross when you leave 
your house and carry it with you wherever you go. But Jesus doesn't leave us without encouragement as we carry our crosses. Think about what Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about up on that mountain. They were talking about Jesus' departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. I mean, think about it. They could have talked about so many more topics up there. Couldn't Jesus and Moses have talked about how cool doing the ten plagues was? Or crossing the Red Sea? Don't you think... Jesus and Elijah could have talked about how neat it was for Elijah to be taken up to heaven in a whirlwind without dying. But they didn't talk about those things. They talked about Jesus' departure, that he was going to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. And notice that unlike the disciples, Moses and Elijah, they don't discourage Jesus from going to Jerusalem. You see, they knew that Jesus had to go down that mountain. He had to pick his own cross back up, the cross of carrying every one of your sins and my sins, and he was going to have to carry that cross all the way to that other mountain. And he was going to have to climb Mount Calvary, and he was going to have to cry out, it is finished there, as he deposited every one of your sins and nailed them and left them to the cross. The transfiguration, if you think about it, for Peter, James, and John, it was a stunning event. Bright lights, Moses, Elijah, voices speaking from heaven. It dazzled them. It was like heaven on earth. But the transfiguration didn't just dazzle Jesus' disciples. It encouraged them. God pulled back the curtain and gave them a little glimpse of what their Christian faith was all about. The end goal. Heaven with Jesus. But heaven isn't on earth. That's why the voice of God the Father spoke from the cloud and said, this is my son, now listen to him. Peter, James, and John, if you want to get to heaven then you're going to have to go through your life listening to Jesus' voice so you have some voice that's going to compete with all those other voices you're hearing as you go through life. The transfiguration does the same for us, right? It dazzles us. We see the glimpse of heaven. We see the glory that Jesus really has. But it does more than just dazzle us. It encourages us too, right? Because God is giving us a glimpse of what our Christian faith is all about. What we, what you and I believe, and it's not just hocus pocus. We believe in a future glory that God has wrapped up for us in heaven. That's what we believe in. But we're not there yet. Heaven is not on earth. So Jesus says the same thing to you and me. He said to his disciples. Or God says the same thing he said to Jesus' disciples. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus because you cannot by your own reason or strength believe in Jesus as your Lord or come to him. The Holy Spirit has to call you through the gospel. Jesus' voice. Listen to Jesus as you go through life because faith comes by hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Listen to Jesus because you know what I've observed in my 30 years as a missionary and pastor? I've observed that when someone comes to faith and is a Christian and they end up hearing Jesus' voice every week, week in and week out in worship. I've never seen that Christian fall away from the faith. Now isn't that incredible? Listen to Jesus' voice because God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Do you want a good guide for you when you have to go through those difficult times in life? Do you want to have something that will help you avoid ruining your marriage, your job, and your relationships? Do you want to have an answer 
for how you can keep in the faith and not wander away from God when things are going great in your life? Do you want to know how you can keep carrying that cross all the way to heaven and not drop it halfway there and lose out on getting to heaven? Then listen to Jesus. His voice speaks to you of forgiveness, of pardon, of peace, of hope, and heaven. And it's all his voice that's going to say to you at the very end of your life, come, take your inheritance, the place I've prepared for you in heaven. Guess what? Lent begins Wednesday already. It's Ash Wednesday, our first midweek Lenten service. That means for six weeks we get extra opportunities to hear Jesus' voice. So let's listen to him, but not the way that spouses do sometimes, already thinking of what they're going to say. Let's listen to him, not the way that teenagers think parents listen to them with their minds made up. Let's listen to Jesus with minds empty and open, because isn't Jesus' voice the only one that will silence your fears? and dry your tears? Isn't Jesus' voice the only one that will soothe your guilt and give you hope? All right? Father says, this is my son. Listen to him. Amen.